breaking the wall of religious public opinion. How the study of interfaith cross-pollination in the Islamicate world can uncover common ground. Sabina Schmidtke, Freie Universität Berlin and the University of Pennsylvania. In November 1989, I was in Oxford working on my dissertation, following the events on TV. Thank you. Fragment of an 11th century Muslim theological text copied by a Muslim scribe. And here the same text copied by a Jewish scribe. Leaf of a 13th century Jewish philosophical text copied by a Muslim scribe. And here the same text copied by a Jewish scribe. Fragment of the Quran transcribed into Hebrew characters. And here a Hebrew Bible transcribed into Arabic characters. Ladies and gentlemen, in the medieval, late medieval and pre-modern world of Islam, Muslims, Jews and Christians constituted a unique cultural and intellectual commonality. They shared the language, Arabic, which they spoke in their daily life and which they also used for their theological, philosophical, legal and scientific writings. Moreover, they often read the same books so that the continuous multidimensional exchange of ideas texts and form of discourse was the norm rather than the exception. While this has been amply demonstrated, especially for the 9th to 12th centuries of the Common Era, scholars usually opt for a one-dimensional approach with an often exclusive focus on either Muslim, Jewish or Christian authors and their writings. In all three fields and for a variety of reasons, the scholarly investigation of the so-called rational sciences beyond denominational borders is still in the beginning phase. The approach I'm arguing for aims at crossing the boundaries between three major disciplines in academia and research, namely Islamic studies, Jewish studies, and the study of Eastern Christianity. Such an approach also serves a wider purpose. In a world in which borders, national, religious, cultural, economic, increasingly gain significance, academic research can and should demonstrate that intellectual developments characteristically disregard any such borders and that symbiosis, which is often inaptly idealized in anachronistic terms such as tolerance or pluralism, was often the norm rather than the exception. This held true particularly in one of today's hottest conflict areas, the Middle East. I'm arguing that an open mind in research, a willingness to widen the scope of scholarly investigation and to share its results with a wider audience can significantly contribute to shaping a less biased and more refined public opinion. I shall discuss three case studies in order to demonstrate that this intellectual whirlpool effect touched Muslims, Christians, and Jews alike. It would be incorrect to say that since they were the dominant community, it was exclusively the Muslims who were at the giving end, while the Christian and Jewish minorities were only ever at the receiving end. Three cases I have chosen rather represent three different patterns. Case one, a Christian convert to Islam who was active in Baghdad during the 9th century. Case two, a Jewish philosopher, also from Baghdad, who was active during the 13th century and significantly influenced the development of Muslim philosophy over the following centuries. And case three, a late descendant of the famous Jewish philosopher and legal scholar Moses Maimonides, who acted as head of the rabbinite Jewish community of Cairo in the 15th century. Case one represents a familiar pattern, namely that of a convert who polemicizes against his former religion, possibly with the aim of convincing his Muslim patron of the genuineness of his conversion. A Christian convert to Islam by the name of Ibn Rabban Tabari, an accomplished scholar of medicine, composed after his conversion to Islam two refutations of his former religion. A first brief text is a straightforward refutation of Christianity. The second one 
entitled The Book of Religion and Empire, which he dedicated to the reigning caliph al Mutawakkil, contains an extensive discussion of passages taken from virtually all books of the Bible that, according to the author, predict the mission of the Prophet Muhammad although his former co-religionists regarded the same passages as testimonies to Jesus. Being primarily addressed to a Christian readership, it seems to have taken two centuries for the book to come to the attention of Muslim readers. From then on, however, it became very popular among Muslim authors who implied the biblical testimonies contained in the book in the polemics against both Christianity and Judaism. Case two completely breaks away from the familiar pattern. Ezza Daula ibn Kamuna was born into a Jewish family of 13th century Baghdad and received a thorough education in both Jewish and Islamic letters. Little is known about his life, but it is evident that he held a high-ranking position in the administration of the Ilkhanid Empire, although there is no indication that he ever converted to Islam. As was the case with many Muslim scholars of his time, he enjoyed the patronage of the Minister of State, Shamsuddin Giovanni, and his family, to whom he dedicated most of his works. He also corresponded with the most important intellectuals of his time. Ibn Kamuna's philosophical writings, and particularly his commentary on the Kitab al-Talwihat of the 12th century founder of a new type of Islamic philosophy, Shihab al-Din al as well as his independent works in this discipline, significantly shaped the development of Islamic philosophy in the eastern lands of Islam over the following centuries. Ibn Kamuna's commentary on Sukhavadi's Talwihat, the first commentary ever written on this work, immediately became very popular and was extensively quoted in the philosophical works of his Muslim contemporaries and of the following generations. Hundreds of copies of Ibn Kamuna's philosophical writings were produced still during his lifetime and over the decades and centuries following his death. The majority of Muslim scholars and scribes were aware that he was Jewish and referred to him as al-Yahudi or al-Israeli. Others do not mention his Jewishness at all, which suggests that it was a matter of no concern to, for them. Compared with the wide spread reception of his philosophical oeuvre among Muslims, the Jewish reception of his writings is meager. Case three concerns the outstanding Jewish scholar David ben Yeshua Maimonides, the last head of the Jewish community of Egypt from the descendants of Moses Maimonides. In contrast to Ibn Kamuna, his professional life was within the confines of the Jewish community and his works all written in Arabic, but in Hebrew characters, circulated exclusively among Jewish readers. Born in Egypt, David succeeded his father Yeshua Maimonides as Nagid, or head of the community, following the latter's death in 1355. For reasons that remain unclear, he left his homeland to take up residence in Syria for a decade. He resumed his office as head of the community after his return to Egypt, and retained it until his death. Apart from being a prolific author himself, David is well known as a book collector and an accomplished scribe, and numerous autographed copies of works by earlier Jewish and Muslim authors in a variety of disciplines have survived. It was particularly during his time in Syria that David assembled an impressive library containing numerous copies of works that he had either commissioned or copied himself. These testify to his scholarly abilities and his erudition in both the Jewish and Muslim literary traditions. He wrote a commentary on Maimonides' Mishneh Torah, an influential code of Jewish law, as well as numerous works in the field of ethics, philosophy, logic, as well as a comprehensive handbook of Sufi mysticism. These works testify to David's deep immersion into a variety of Muslim rational sciences. In philosophy, he was not only familiar with the peripatetic thought of Avicenna, but was also acquainted with numerous writings of the founder of Illuminationist philosophy, Shihab al-Din al and he may have possessed a copy of Ibn Kamuna's commentary on Sukhavadi's Kitab al-Talwihat that I had just referred to. 
David was likewise familiar with the writings of the renowned Muslim thinker Ghazali and of the latter student Fakhadina Razi. In addition, he quotes extensively from the earlier Muslim literature on mysticism and was evidently well versed in the Muslim astronomical tradition. Although none of the works of David ben Yeshua ever reached a wider Muslim readership, as was the case with the writings of his co-religionist Ibn Kamuna, he did reach out on a more personal level. During his time in Syria, David befriended the Muslim scholar Ali bin Taibura, author of a commentary on Maimonides' Mishneh Torah. It took modern scholars quite some time to accept that the Muslim scholar had commented on a text by Maimonides that was originally composed in Hebrew. It is now clear that Ali bin Taibura got interested in the Mishneh Torah due to the influence of David, whose Arabic translation of the Mishneh Torah and his commentary on the work he used. The extant manuscripts of David's translation and commentary and of Ali bin Taibura's commentary on Maimonides' Mishneh Torah thus provide evidence for a fruitful and stimulating exchange between two distinguished scholars of the 15th century, a Jew and a Muslim, on a text of primarily Jewish interest. These three cases may suffice to demonstrate that there were no fixed patterns of crossing intellectual boundaries in the medieval, late medieval and pre-modern world of Islam, and that the exchange of ideas and texts was more variegated and far more frequent than is often assumed. This, theoretically, widely accepted historical reality calls, in my view, for radically breaking away from the established one-dimensional academic pattern, replacing it with a multidimensional interdisciplinarity, not only beyond established disciplinary boundaries, but also beyond political ones. The scholarly attention, or rather non-attention, that had been paid until recently to the cases of Ibn Kamuna, David ben Yeshua, and Ali bin Taibura, and the evident difficulties of scholarship to come to terms with a Jewish thinker who significantly shaped the course of Islamic philosophy, or with a Jewish, uh, with Muslim intellectual who commented on Maimonides' Mishneh Torah, shows the extent to which even modern scholars are restricted in their thought to real or imagined religious borders. An enhanced awareness of the constant intertwinedness of the various worlds under consideration would also lead scholars to new, so far unexplored, materials and perspectives. For example, much of the literary legacy of the theological movement of the Mu'tazila, one of the most significant strands within rational Islamic theology between the 8th through 11th century, has been lost in the Islamic world. However, Due to the Jewish reception of its doctrines, Jewish repositories possess comprehensive holdings of Jewish copies of many of those lost Muslim texts, sometimes in Arabic script, at times transcribed into Hebrew characters. Exploring these materials opens entirely new perspectives for students of Islamic studies. Most proponents of religious boundaries, be they Muslims, Jews, or Christians, claim the past as their prime witness to justify their own boundary drawing. It is the responsibility of scholarship to show the other side of the coin and thus to help form a different, less biased and more open-minded public opinion. Thank you.